Chapter 3 in Advanced Public Relations covers the research basis for the practice of public relations. Research forms the heart of public relations. First, organizations must decide on their long-term goals based on a mission statement. Then they choose short-term objectives that are on the pathway to achieving their goals. Primary research consists of original research, while secondary research consists of reading articles about the research performed by others. Informal research deals with casual observations, such as watching where customers go inside of a store. Sometimes organizations should examine or audit their public relations process to determine how effective it was. Qualitative research consists of a subjective studies based on opinions, such as interviews and focus groups. Quantitative research consists of objective studies based on measurable numerical attributes, such as the dollar value of sales. Goals deal with the long-term expectations of the future of the organization. Objectives are short-term mileposts on the way to achieving the long-term goals. Objectives must meet three characteristics. First, objectives must be relevant to achieving the goals. Second, objectives must be numerical measures. Third, objectives must have a timetable for their completion. Primary research is performed by the researcher, like looking at original documents such as customer complaint forms or directly gathering the data for the research. Secondary research is looking at articles or data gathered by someone else. One major source of secondary research comes from national rating services. These firms verify the number of readers or viewers of a specific media source, such as a newspaper, magazine, or broadcaster. They also provide demographic information, such as the average age of the viewers or a breakdown between males and female readers. Informal research describes a situation rather than make predictions about the future. It makes use of interviews or focus groups that are more open than surveys, which limit respondents to multiple choice answers. So informal research does not begin with assumptions, and thus it can discover unexpected results. Informal research also uses inconspicuous observations such as looking at the zip codes or the phone number prefixes to tell in a general manner where the customers live. Informal research also includes audits of public relation activities to determine how effective they have been. Audits may consist of quantifiable studies of communications, such as how many articles resulted from the press releases. Or the audit may consist of qualifiable studies of public relation efforts, such as an opinion of whether the press releases were well written or not. Communication audits should focus on the public response to public relation activities. One quantifiable measure would be the number of viewers or readers who were exposed to the public relation message. Another quantifiable measure would be the results of a survey of the public to determine if they even remember the message or if they consider the message to be credible. A more expensive approach would be to interview members of the public regarding their impression of the public relations message. Social media can provide a more immediate measure such as the number of people who like a message on Facebook. The whole point of communication audits 
is to measure how well the public relations activities have accomplished their objectives. This feedback should help the organization adjust their public relations activities to improve the effectiveness of the process. Opinion audits go to the heart of public relations. The aim of public relations is to change public opinion, and these audits measure whether or not the objective was achieved. The main research technique is to use surveys, which may be also called questionnaires. These surveys may be paper documents mailed to re respondents, or the questions may be asked over a telephone. Increasingly, surveys are internet-based because it's much quicker and less costly to use web-based surveys. Some inconspicuous observations can also be used, which tend to be more accurate because people act differently if they know they're being watched. Examples of unobtrusive measures are tracking visitors on websites or watching where the customers go in a store through the security cameras. These unobtrusive metrics can be controversial because people may feel that the observations violate their privacy. For example, stores can track customer movements through, store, through the store based on Wi-Fi activities of the customer's smartphones. However, this plan upsets so many customers that the store that proposed this idea quickly abandoned it. Secondary research can be used for opinion audits because the government or research firms compile much data such as price indices or measures of the consumer's confidence that the economy will improve. Retail stores measure the traffic of customers into the store using unintrusive measures such as pressure mats or light beams across store entrances. They also carefully track sales patterns based on the UPC barcodes which record sales of items. In addition, the so-called loyalty cards allow stores to analyze sales based on customer characteristics and patterns of previous purchases by the customer. They can also gather zip codes or phone numbers from customers to more accurately analyze where their customers live. Then they can match the zip codes to census data to roughly estimate the average income of their groups of customers. Qualitative research is subjective, based on interpretations of data, which is basically an opinion. It may include trend analysis of past data in an effort to predict future results, or it may be studies of individuals or small groups of the public in an attempt to understand why people hold certain opinions. Sometimes the research subjects agree to keep diaries, to record what shows they watch on TV or what foods they eat over a week-long period. Interviews take time and may last hours, but they help to better understand why the subjects hold a given opinion. Focus groups are small gatherings of people who are asked general, open-ended questions. The interactions within the focus group often bring out comments that the individuals would not have volunteered in a lone interview. Panels are also based on groups of people, but instead of a discussion, the panel responds to mostly closed-ended questions, often with yes or no answers. The benefit is that panel interviews are much less time-consuming than individual interviews. Quantitative research involves numerical measures of whether or not the objectives were met. One measure is the number of news articles that were generated by the press releases, the length of the articles, and where they were placed in the publication, such as near the front of the magazine or buried at the end. Quantitative measures can be compared to qualitative measures and they may be able to validate each other. One of the principal uses of quantitative data is to form a plot to indicate trend lines or to 
find changes in direction, such as perhaps a fall off in the numbers of press releases. However, these quantitative measures of indirect activities do not provide direct measures of the effects of the public relations process. In addition, these quantitative measures can be costly and take a great deal of time. However, survey data can also be measured quantitatively, such as the percentage of respondents who said they had a positive impression of the organization. Surveys are flexible instruments because the question can cover a broad range of issues. There are many different options for conducting surveys. Written questionnaires may be sent through the postal mail or through the email. Alternatively, someone can ask questions over the telephone or in a face-to-face -face interview. While conducting a valid survey is an art form, people like to be helpful and to offer their opinions. However, if the subject is controversial, respondents often lie on surveys. One famous study asked people what magazines they subscribed to, but no one would admit that they subscribed to Playboy or Penthouse or some other sexually oriented magazine, although obviously somebody subscribes to them. Another limitation of surveys is the structured nature of the results, because the questions are mostly multiple choice or on a scale of 1 to 7. Surveys are very difficult to conduct well, so many survey results are biased or inaccurate. In order for the results to accurately represent the public opinions, the sample of people selected for the survey should be random. Random means that everybody in the public has an equal probability of being part of the sample. If the sample does meet this probability test and the sample size is large enough, then the sample will be representative of the population. However, it is very difficult to choose a truly random sample because usually one cannot identify everybody in the population of interest. So researchers make assumptions like randomly dialing phone numbers and assume that this will result in a random sample of people. This has been common practice for decades, but today cell phones have put this assumption in question. Sample error, often quoted as plus or minus a given percentage, is a function of the size of the sample based on the assumption that the sample is randomly selected. The larger the sample size, the smaller the sampling error. Critical studies such as medical trials will usually have a large sample size so that the sampling error is plus or minus 1%. On the other hand, social science surveys, such as those for public relations, are not life or death issues. So usually the sample size is just large enough that the sample and error is plus or minus 3 to 5 percent. Occasionally a survey will have a sample and error of 10 percent, but that is very unusual. Researchers often choose non-random samples and then compare the demographic makeup of the sample, such as gender and age, to the population as a whole. If the demographics are close, then it is a reasonable assumption that the non-random sample is representative of the population as a whole. One way to choose a non-random sample is a convenience or accidental sample. One might go into a classroom and survey everyone who came to class that day. Or a researcher may pick every tenth person who walked through a door into a store. Another non-random sampling technique is to deliberately choose people based on their characteristics. For example, a research might choose the first woman to walk through the entrance and then the next male to go through the door. Quota samples are selections from subgroups. For example, a researcher might choose five people under the age of 20, five between the ages of 20 and 30, 
and five more who are over 30 years old. Goals deal with the mission of the organization and objectives are the milestones on the way to achieving these goals. Primary research is conducted by the researcher, while secondary research means looking at research done by someone else. Informal research consists of observations that result in descriptions of the public that we're interested in. Formal research consists of structured studies that result in audits. Communication audits measure the extent of public relation activities, such as the number of press releases. Opinion audits measure public attitudes, which is the essence of public relations, which is to change public opinion. Qualitative research consists mostly of interviews with people in the public of interest to the organization. Quantitative research mostly consists of surveys that can be statistically analyzed. To become more reliable, samples should be selected randomly so as to reflect the makeup of the public.